Hi everyone, Mr. Sinti here, and I have the pleasure to be discussing with you today the axial skeleton, and in particular, within the axial skeleton, uh, the emphasis in this particular video will be on the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. That's right. Um, I have made uh, previously videos on the bones of the skull, both cranial and facial bones, and of course, that's part of the uh, axial skeleton as well. The axial skeleton, uh, called axial skeleton because it sort of comes to right down the center or axis, right in the center of rotation of the human body, and that's, and that's what we're talking about today. So we're gonna look at the vertebral column and thoracic cage. Now you might have background in this, uh, but there might be a few things that you'll pick up, so I, I hope you enjoy the video. So vertebral column, first off, let's get uh, a few of these anatomical terms uh, straight so that we can communicate properly. So vertebrae, 24 vertebrae, so in your spine, if you will. But singularly, it's vertebra. So if you're talking about one particular vertebra or vertebrae in general. And then of course you have your sacrum right here, or sacrum, and your coccyx, which is your tailbone right here. So sacrum and coccyx. So together that's the vertebral column. And then you have your thoracic cage, cage because of course it's sort of a caged in area protecting all of your crucial visceral organs such as the heart and lungs, etc. And that's made up of 24 bones including the breastbone right here in the center, which is the sternum. So we're gonna take a look at those in the video today, and we'll look at some of their functions and uh, markings. So let's begin. So as I mentioned, the, the, uh, it's all about supporting and protecting the body cavity. And, and there, it's also important in the axial skeleton to attach muscles of the head, neck, and trunk to these skeletal bones. and it, the ribs, as you may know, uh, perform respiratory movement, and it also stabilizes, the axial skeleton does, stabilizes the appendicular skeleton, which is made, composed of arms in the pelvic uh, girdle and legs or lower limbs, okay? So this is our discussion right here, axial skeleton, vertebral column, and thoracic cavity. Uh, and uh, thoracic cage, I meant to say. So vertebral column or spine protects the spinal cord. So right out of the gate, most important function is to protect that spinal cord, which is a large bundle of nerves coming uh, in a southerly direction, going anteriorly out of the brain. Okay, And it's, it also supports the head and body. And again, it's made up of 26 bones, uh, sacrum, coccyx, and uh, vertebrae. Okay, So the vertebrae themselves are, are, are composed of, in the neck area, you might be familiar with this, in the neck area we have cervical vertebrae, and we're gonna look at those, thoracic vertebrae, and lumbar vertebrae. So the reason that they're different is that they have slightly different morphological or anatomical structures and markings that suit their function perfectly. And so there's seven of them, 12 and five. And I've, I've read uh, an easy way to remember this is sort of like breakfast time is at seven, cervical, so there's seven vertical vertebrae. Uh, Lunch time is 12 noon, okay? And the reason the thoracic vertebrae are uh, unique is that they're, they articulate or, or connect with ribs. And so that's their, that's their uh, mainstay. Uh, and then lower back uh, is five lumbar vertebrae. In other words, dinner time's at five although that might be an early dinner for some. And then your, your sacrum, which is right here, this sort of flattened shaped uh, bone, uh, the very last vertebrae, the number five vertebrae, articulates with the sacrum right here. And then you can see the sacrum articulates with the coccyx right there. And that's part of the axial skeleton. Now, the, the pelvis is part of the appendicular skeleton that, that will come later. So one of the things about the spine is that there's four main curves of the spine. So you have this cervical curve, a thoracic curve right here. Here's a cervical vertebrae, a thoracic curve, your lumbar curve, and your sacral curve right here. Now some, some uh, occur uh, secondarily, meaning that they develop as the infant learns to balance their head and keep their head up in their neck. So that curve sort of develops right here. The thoracic curve, however, is a primary curve, which is means that you're born with that. 
and it accommodates the thoracic organs right here in the body. The lumbar curve is one of those secondary curves which helps to balance the weight of the trunk over the limbs and it develops as the infant is beginning to stand right over here. Okay, So that's supportive curve. And then the sacral curve is again a primary curve which accommodates all the organs of, uh, in, the, in the particular pelvic region right here. Okay, So spinal curves. Now that's normal spinal curves. Let's talk a little bit about abnormal curves. And you have this um, kyphosis right here which is uh, kind of a humped back right here whereas the spine is sort of leaning forward right here, kyphosis. And there's different types of kyphosis. One of, I started to mention one or two. There's osteoporosis uh, related kyphosis, which is kind of common. And it's usually in elderly and adults. And it has to do with the fact that the bone becomes more brittle over time and more porous. And so slight fractures can develop along the, the vertebral column. And what happens is when these cracks and fissures become more and more pronounced over time, the weight sort of just collapses the bones and uh, there's a bit of a crushing that occurs and the segment of the spine tips forward. And so there's a bit of an arch right there. Then you have another type of spinal curve, which is abnormal, which is uh, lordosis, and it's called swayback. This is where the spine of a person curves significantly inward right over here in the lower back or lumbar area. And then maybe most famous, perhaps you may have heard of this, is scoliosis. A person with scoliosis has a sideways um, look to them. In other words, their spine is sort of S-shape or C-shape, if you will, scoliosis. Now, this particular video isn't about particularly these disorders, but I do welcome you and I hope the point of of the video is to spur curiosity or spark it, if you will, and then that will allow you to do further research on these disorders uh, because that's really what it's all about. It's not necessarily about normal anatomy and physiology, it's about abnormal, okay? And so let's look as we approach the vertebral column or spine, let's look at a typical vertebrae or vertebra, I should say, a typical one so we can get some. Uh, terms understood and then we'll look specifically at the different regions the cervical thoracic and lumbar so first off you have this prominent flat area right here this is anterior towards the front of of the body and posterior so this is your the the back as as, as you're reaching back posterior right here so we have this vertebral body or centrum area right here and this is a weight bearing right here it transfers the weight along the spine we have this vertebral arch right here, okay, the vertebral arch, and it creates a, a margin in this giant hole right here, which is the vertebral foramen, okay, and, and you might have guessed the fact that that foramen is housing the spinal cord, which is traveling down from the brain, down the back, okay. Now, this archway right here is a uh, Lambda is are these flat areas right over here, and so it's the lambda are creating that sort of uh, vertebral arc, creating the walls of it. All right, and the roof, I should say. Now you have this projection that or process that's coming out uh, of the vertebrae. It's the spinous process, and that's what you're what you feel when you're rubbing on the back uh, of your skin. The spinous processes, and then you have coming out. Uh, perpendicular to this laterally on both sides you have uh, transverse processes that are coming out on the side okay uh, more about these uh, articular processes but these structures right here are pedestals right here you have these two sort of foot like structures although they don't really look like a foot to me okay and then we have again the foramen right there which is where the spinal cord is okay so emphasis on the spinous process coming off right here and then here's your transverse process or processes coming off to the side another perspective lateral perspective on uh, and also inferior view of a typical vertebra so here's the body here's your pedestal right there here's your uh, spinous process right here that's coming off uh, and then here's your superior articular process. And then down below, as you might imagine, you have inferior process as well. Okay. Uh, a close-up 
looking at the real bones at the superior articular process. Okay? More about their function as the video proceeds. Uh, here are the inferior process. They have facets on them right there okay, as well. Uh, this is a look here. Now, uh, it takes time to sort of get a full understanding of this. But basically, if I were to say, is that these articular process, okay, here's the superior ones from above. Here's the inferior ones. Or if we take it down, there's three vertebrae here. Here's the inferior one. You can see the articular processes superior right here, uh, they, they connect or interlock with the vertebrae below. And so they articulate. The articular facet's function is to prevent undesirable movement between adjoining vertebrae. And so that's their point, is that they hook up right there. And then you can see here more about this. There's an intervertebral disc, which is not made up of bone. It's made up of fibrous cartilage, and that also supports um, the jumping up and down and running uh, and cushioning the bones to make sure that there's no uh, uh, trauma between the bones. Okay, So I think this is a great view. Of, uh, of the vertebrae. It's a posterior view and how three vertebrae articulate with one another. You can get a real good sense of it this way. And then again, here is the spinous process. And then of course, the transverse processes are coming off to the side there. Okay, another look, lateral. Um, and it's a little bit of a section right here. You can see the superior articular facet here and here's the inferior one. Here's the transverse process coming off to the side. Okay. And here's some in, uh, intervertebral foramen, okay, where, where blood vessels will come in and out in nerves. All right. And then, of course, the major foramen, vertebral foramen, coming in a downward direction, houses the spinal cord. Okay. Again, just another look, inferior view. Uh, you can see here it's the spinous process, the transverse process, the vertebral body. Okay. Now, I mentioned these uh, intervertebral foramen right here, and then these house, uh, and they're basically gaps between the pedicels of adjacent vertebrae, right here and here and here. And those are for uh, nerve and again, blood uh, vessels to come out. But mostly uh, spinal cord is branching in, in coming off lateral directions. And so that, those holes right there are for that. So the spinal cord's coming down and then branching through the intervertebral foramen. Again, the foramen or, or ver vertebral canal, if you will, or spinal canal, uh, ho ho houses the spinal cord. Okay. And then again, here it is. This is a good view in case you're you're wondering what I was talking about, or housing the spinal cord. So it, it's enclosed right there. And so here's your cervical and your thoracic and then lumbar vertebrae down below. So again, I mentioned um, before about these vertebral discs. And again, their, their function or physiology is to absorb shocks, which is very important. Um, sometimes we can have trauma, again, like um, to, the, to the back. And what can happen is um, these discs can actually slip and, uh, and they can move um, anteriorly or posteriorly, and both of, both of those are issues. Because again, you're bumping into uh, the spinal cord here, and it could it could be severe pain, et cetera. And so, some there's different treatments for this, and, and um, one of them ultimately is surgery. But they they're basically pads of fibrocartilage uh, to help absorb shock. And and again, you can see them here and here. So cartilage, and again, you can see them here. And there, okay. So now let's take a look at the at the various regions of, of the vertebral uh, column. And so, just to point this out, that the, the vertebrae or vertebra are numbered, okay, and they they go from top down. And so, number one would be the superior, and then the the larger number would be inferior. So, in other words, cervical or C one is the very first on the top and that articulates with the skull. And then at the very last vertebra is the lumbar number five and that articulates with the sacrum. Okay, so this is your lowest one, this is your highest one or superior or inferior. And each of them again I mentioned has specific characteristics and looks to them. I find this discussion particularly interesting. I'm, I'm just uh, amazed uh, both anatomically physiologically, and I would also add evolutionarily, 
how these different vertebrae have taken on certain morphologies. So we're gonna look at them, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and then uh, sacrum and coccyx. We'll look at these as well. So the cervical vertebrae has the smallest body. Okay, now you remember the body was that flat um, area that supports uh, a lot of the weight, but it basically, the bodies will increase in size as you move down from C1 to C7. But basically the cervical vertebrae only need, and I say only, but they need to support the head, okay? And they have another characteristic, they have the largest vertebral foramen, which is the largest part of the spinal cord. And so that foramen, as we're gonna see, we get uh, more, the diameter of it gets smaller as you move down to uh, L5. Okay, so and then I also want to point out there's a slight sloping from posterior to anterior here in the cervical vertebrae, okay, which creates a little bit of a curve. So let's take a look. Here's the spin spinous processes coming off. The transverse ones are coming off to the side here, if you can see that. Uh, and we're going to take a look down at, uh, in particular, we'll take a look at C1 and C2 because those are most, most interesting. So all but the C1 have very short spinous processes. And so this is a typical spinous process of a cervical vertebrae, and it's also bifid, uh, meaning that it, there's a little bit of a notch right there. So that's characteristic of it. So as you can see, there's slight variation from that typical bone that I was showing you before. So here's the vertebral arch right here. And then notice this, look how large the vertebral foramen is right there. Okay, and here's your pedestal right over here, coming off to the side. Here's your superior articular facet, okay? Um, here's a costal process, which, which uh, we'll, we'll connect with, with ribs. We'll talk about that. And then here's the vertebral body right over here. Okay. Now, you may have noticed on uh, laterally on the cervical vertebrae, there's holes on the side in addition to the vertebral foramen. These are known as the transverse, transverse to the sides foramina or foramen. And basically those protect vertebral arteries and veins. And so you get blood vessels in those two particular holes over there. So here and here, blood vessels are traveling up and down the spinal cord. Okay. Now let's talk about C1. C1 also has a, a common name. It's not just called cervical number one, it's called the atlas. And, that, and it's very famous. The atlas, uh, as you may know, is comes from mythology of holding up the earth, atlas. And so this is hold this particular cervical vertebrae is holding up the, the skull. And it articulates with the skull inferiorly with these two condyles right over here in the occipital bone. And so these are occipital condyles of the skull. And they allow for this sort of rotation like this, in other words, the yes motion. They allow the skull to move forward and down, okay? This is a look just at that C1 or atlas, okay? Notice its unique characteristic is that it has no body, that's kind of interesting, and it has uh, no spinous process, and it has a very large uh, round foramen within, okay? This is posterior, okay, meaning uh, toward, toward the back of your neck, and this is anterior towards the front. Now it has these lateral masses here, which you may uh, have guessed is actually what is articulating with the occipital condyles, allowing the skull to rotate on these two pads right here, which is kind of cool. Okay, and so those are um, those are the facets that again articulate with the occipital lobe of the skull. Anterior, okay, and here's the anterior notch, and here's the posterior notch right here. Now it does have like a little bit of a bump right there, posterior tubercle. And so you get a little bit of a, a little in, uh, <laughs> uh, outflowing here. Now you got two uh, bones happening here. You, you, I wanna emphasize this upper one, which is the cervical one, but, uh, but as you can see below, uh, there's cervical two. And the reason that they're shown together is that there's a, a interaction between them, okay? And so again, this is your this is your back over here. This is the posterior coming laterally, though, postal lateral view. 
Okay, this is C2. The C2 bone is called the axis. All right, but uh, let's just look over here at C1 for a little bit more. The atlas, notice it, it has this uh, transverse ligament, which is really important right here because the at the axis or C2 has this large bone sticking out of it right here in an upward direction, in a superior direction called the dens. And so the dens actually penetrates into the, into the C1, okay? And this uh, transverse ligament sort of surrounds it and tightens it right here. And so that is going to create the, the skull's ability to turn left and to turn right. In other words, the no motion. And it, and it moves around right there, okay? So more about that in a, in a moment. You can see here the axis is sticking up its dens or it's sort of its big tooth, if you will, through the C1. And then I was mentioning before these transverse foramen that are found in the cervical vertebrae that house the verte vertebral, uh, vertebral artery, okay? Right there, which is then gonna uh, move into the subclavian vein. So this is, so this is blood, oxygenated blood coming away from the heart that is traveling in an upward direction up into the in, into the brain okay so more about that c2 as i promised so the axis and i and I, I just wanted to say the axis is sort of like the tidal track of the axial skeleton and so the axis is like the earth is rotating on the axis and so it supports the atlas as you can see so the atlas is sitting on the axis and it has uh uh, a, a heavy spinous process right here and again bifid right there and it attaches muscles of the head and neck and so that's its function now both the axis and and atlas are fused during development around this dens which is this major structure right there okay and, and you can see and that it allows the head to do the no rotation of the head it's really important and again this transverse ligament to repeat is holding that tightly in there. And there's also a slight indentation over here in the anterior arch of the uh, atlas uh, to accommodate the dens. Okay, and here's a, a real picture of C2, and you can see the dens right here. This is the anterior area, and this is posterior area right here. Here are those foramen to the side with the, with, with the uh, vertebral arteries. Now, just sort of jumping down uh, to C7, the very last one, you may recall uh, uh, this from a, a previous discussion. If, you, if you've been watching uh, a video that I was talking about this, if you were to palpate the back of the neck, one of the areas uh, that where you can note is that the very last cervical vertebrae is very prominent. So it has a very large uh, spinous process and it's actually known as prominence, very prominent. And it's the transition to the thoracic, which are below that or inferior to that. That's a long spinous process, okay? As you can see right over here, and it's sort of poking out right there. And you can, you can palpate that. If you're rubbing on the patient's back of their neck, you can sort of feel C7. And you know that like two down from that is the top of the heart, in case you're wondering about that, okay? And you can also detect the fact that if you know that this is the C7, then you'll know that this is T1, and that's where we're going, okay, T1. And do you notice how the numbers uh, start from C1 to C7, and then now we're T1, okay? So we're basically um, traveling in a downward direction. But before we talk about the thoracic vertebrae, I just want to point out this, um, this nu nuchii right here, this nuchii lig lig ligamum, <laughs> It's so difficult to pronounce this. Ligamentum, ligamentum nuchii. Okay, so look at this. It's, it is a ligament that is attaching to the external uh, occipital protuberance. In other words, a little bump on the back of your occipital bone right there. And it's traveling down just your cervical uh, uh, backbone right here. Do you see that? It's holding it in place. It's an elastic ligament and it extends from the skull to C7, and so thus the importance of that long spinous process that's very prominent. And then this ligament 
sort of becomes um, like a cord that travels down the rest of the spine, which is no, known as the supraspinous ligament, okay? As opposed to the ligam ligamum, <laughs> ligamentum nuchii, okay? <laughs> Apologize. So thoracic vertebrae. So there's uh, T1 all the way to T1 right here, all the way down to uh, T12. And of course, the characteristic for the thoracic vertebrae is that they articulate with each of the ribs, and that's what gives them their characteristics. And then, of course, below that are the lumbar. Okay, so let's look at that. So when I was showing you typical vertebrae, I was showing you uh, uh, typically the thoracic vertebrae. Okay, so they have these uh, large sort of heart-shaped uh, bodies, which are very supportive. Do you notice here the vertebral foramen is? Uh, a little bit smaller than in the cervical ones right here. Okay, Here's again your transverse uh, processes and here's the spinous process right there. Okay? Uh, notice how the spinous process is uh, long and slender, so characteristic there. And as I mentioned, uh, characteristic of the thoracic vertebrae is that um, they articulate with the heads of ribs. And so you can see right over here, here's the head of a rib, okay? And it, it, it's articulating right over here, the head or um, capitulum, if you will, is, is the, the verte vertebral end of the rib. Here's the neck of the rib. And you can also see how it, the, tubercle of the tubercle of the rib is also connecting right over here with the transverse process. Okay, so there's a little a little connection right there, all right, and that's known as the transverse costal, costal meaning rib, facet. Okay, so that's a little bit of a connection right there. Now the truth is the uh, capitulum articulates with this area right over here on the side of the body of the thoracic vertebrae, known as the demi facet. Okay, demi facet right over in this area right there, which is. Now, of course, it's not shown, but there's another rib coming off to the other side. So there's these transverse uh, costal facets that attach over here and then over here as well. So they're thick uh, transverse processes for rib articulation. That's what that is. Here's the transverse uh, costal facet right there. All right, and then again, a look at the typical this is superior view or, or looking down at the thoracic vertebrae. All right. And this is where they are going down from uh, superior to posterior. You can see uh, T1 <clears throat> and then T2, T3 as you move all the way down to T12. Okay, And then you start to get into the lumbar area right in there. So T10 to T12 is kind of a transition area into the lumbar area. So this is sort of uh, middle of the spine, okay? Uh, lateral view of the thoracic vertebrae. And again, why so many different views? What's the point of this? Well, anatomically, it's difficult to understand what you're, what you're dealing with unless you're able to manipulate it from different viewpoints. And so I think it's useful to take a look at it, at it this way. Here's the spinous process. And again, remember, I mentioned it's sort of long and thin. And then here's your transverse processes that are coming off on both sides, perpendicular, okay? Now let's move on to the lumbar. These are the largest, uh, maybe, maybe that's obvious, the largest vertebrae as you're moving inferiorly. And then check this out. They have sort of oval-shaped vertebral bodies. Again, uh, strong and supportive of, of, of weight. And they're very thick, okay? So they're thickest of all, thicker than the thoracic ones. Do you notice here the, the vertebral foramen is smaller, okay? And it's sort of triangular shape, if you will. Do you notice it right here? And also there's no uh, costal or transverse costal facets. Why? Because the ribs are not articulating with the lumbar vertebrae. So that may be obvious, okay? Here's another lateral view of the typical, typical vertebral uh, uh, lumbar, okay? And so here you are. Uh, here's the superior facing in an upward direction here in the inferior. Uh, articular facets, again, that artic articulate with the ones above and below. They're, they're sort of face down and out, the inferior ones, sort of in an 
and an arc like that. And the other ones face in and upward. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see it that way. But the transverse processes are, are fairly slender, just a characteristic, and they project dorsal laterally. And the spinous process is, as you can see, really short uh, compared to the thoracic and very heavy. And, and the point of that uh, spinous process is to attach lower back muscles. Okay, So that's what's being attached to that area. And again, you can see this. This is a great view of the lumbar vertebrae, L1 through L5. And you can see that L5 articulates with the sacrum uh, right over here. And so here's your lumbar vertebrae. Do you notice how the spinous processes are short but yet strong? Okay. Now, I like this, this particular image because it contrasts the, the, the cervical ones with your typical uh, thoracic vertebrae. And here's your, your lumbar. And you can see how, how the bodies increase. You can see how the foramen decreases in size. And you can see some different characteristics here with the uh, spinous processes as well. Okay, so let's move down into the sacrum. Now the sacrum is a really cool looking bone, I think. And it's flat and it protects the reproductive organs, which are housed in, in, in the pelvic uh, cavity, and al also urinary, meaning like your urinary bladder and digestive organs, principally your lower part of it, your alimentary canal, like for example, your colon and rectum. All right, and it the sacrum attaches to the ap to the uh, appendicular skeleton okay so here's your axial skeleton which is the spine and the sacrum but there is a connection so a joint an articulation with the appendicular and this is a famous joint if you will you may have heard of it before it's the sacral uh, il iliac so this is your ilium right here so it's a sacrum and ilium in other words the sacroiliac joint or si joint uh, and there's very broad muscles that are associated with this area to help move your thigh. Okay. Now, uh, there's a little bit of a difference in adult sacrum versus um, a child. And so it consists of the, the adult sacrum consists of five fused sacral vertebrae, S1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And, it, and they fuse together uh, between puberty and, and also 25 uh, to 30. And so it becomes a, a continuum right in right in this area okay here's a lateral view of the of the sacrum right there okay now there's all kinds of features uh, and markings on there and so you have you know this area in the center here or sacral canal okay so again the the very end of the spinal cord is coming down in this area which, which basically replaces the vertebral canal okay uh, you get this area right in here is the sac sacral uh, cornea, which is sort of this horn-shaped area right in here, and it's formed by the uh, the <laughs> the lambda uh, lambda of the of the fifth sacral vertebrae right in here, this on this bottom area. Okay, and there's a look at this. Okay. Now this area down here, this sort of apex of the of the of the sacra uh, <laughs> sacrum. Uh, is articulating with the coccyx bone, which is below right there. All right, and so you have this sacral hiatus, uh, which is this region right in here, which is the inferior uh, opening to the canal, and that's that's basically covered with connective tissue, though. If you were to overlay uh, fibrous connective tissue on that, and then you have these uh, these uh, foramen right here, and there's four. On, on one side and four on the other side right here, sac sacral foramia, okay? And those are openings right in there. These flat areas are ala, and, and here's your base, okay? Uh, you, can, you can keep going with this. It's just a, a matter of how de uh, much depth that you want to cover. Again, I mentioned right over here, these the ala are wings on both sides of the sacrum right there. And those are significant. Again, if this is your feature of study, uh, that's the articulation point uh, at the sacroiliac joint, so the, uh, and also an attachment to muscles. So it's relevant or not relevant, okay? And I mentioned this before. Uh, this apex is the point of articulation between the coxal, coxus. So it's the uh, sacral coxygeal joint, 
right in this area where the red arrow is pointing. That's the articulation with the coccyx. Now here's your coccyx or tailbone. I find it fascinating. People always think that uh, it's not true, but, but humans do have a tail. Uh, and here it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. Uh, it attaches ligaments uh, that um, uh, control and constrict muscles of the, of the anus. That's one of its functions. Okay, So there's ligaments there. Uh, and, and there's also many tendons. And it consists of, depending on the individual, uh, three to five uh, vertebrae, right in this little area right there, okay? And so let's now transition to this thoracic cage conversation. So this thoracic cage or rib cage is very important part of, of the axial skeleton. And it, and it supports the thoracic cavity, which consists of the thoracic vertebrae pos posteriorly, the ribs, and then right in the front, most most prominently is your breastbone or sternum. And so that's where we're going right here in the thoracic cage. So here's your sternum right here. And the sternum, we'll finish our conversation today with a look at the sternum and the three bones that comprise it, the uh, manubrium, the body of the sternum, and the, zyvo the xiphoid process, which is sort of like this little sore down here. But let's take a look at these ribs. First off that I wanted to mention is that these ribs, when they articulate with the sternum, they articulate via cartilage. So do you see these dark and red areas right here? This is known as costal cartilage. Costal cartilage right in this area. Okay, so that's what's actually connecting to the sternum. That's important to consider. Okay, so the function of the thoracic cage may be obvious but it's protection, and so it's protecting the crucial heart. It's protecting the crucial lungs and thymus gland that, uh, in, your, uh, in your throat. And it's also the attachment for muscles, okay? So you have your, if you go back here, there's muscles in between uh, the ribs, so intercostal muscles, and that is important for increasing and decreasing the, the volume of the rib cage and therefore affecting pressure which will allow uh, for air to come in and out okay and it also attachments uh, to muscle to the vertebral column and it also is uh, it, it attaches muscles uh, of the pelvic or, or pectoral girdle pectoral girdle right up here and upper limbs okay so ribs themselves uh, are costal or costi costi costia uh, there's 12 pairs of them Okay, and they're, they're curved uh, and also flat in instances, and they extend uh, and connect to the thoracic vertebrae as we were mentioning before. And so ribs can be divided into two categories. They could be true ribs or false ribs. <laughs> and I, I love that because it's sort of like, what do you mean false ribs? But you'll see. What we mean by that is that the true ribs uh, are attached to the sternum. Okay, so that, that's what we're getting at right there. So the true ribs, as you can see here where the cursor is, are ribs one through seven, and they attach to the sternum, of course, via the, the costal cartilage right there. Okay. Now the false ribs don't directly attach to the sternum. Okay, so that's ribs eight through ten. Okay, and those those can fuse together and they merge with the cartilage before reaching the sternum, okay, eight through ten. As you can see here, right over in this area. And then, do you notice here, I'll come over here, uh, we have two uh, floating ribs, 11 and 12. Okay, and those connect to the vertebrae only and into some back muscles. They have no connection with the sternum. Let me come back over here. As you can see, maybe not the best angle, but 11 and 12 are, are, your, are your are floating ribs right over here. Maybe another image coming that will make that a little bit clearer. Now, I mentioned this before and how the ribs articulate with, with the, the vertebrae. So I won't really go too much into it other than reminding you that there is an articulation between ribs and the vertebral column, and particularly the thoracic vertebrae. And the area of this is uh, at the neck, and they attach over here at the head or capitulum, and this tubercle area of the of the rib, which is sort of this small, with elevated uh, dorsal on the top 
part where they articulate right over there. Okay, and they again they um, the head of the rib attaches to the demi facet of the of the vertebrae of the thoracic vertebrae. Okay, and there are ligaments. Uh, again, uh, difficult to know just how far you want to go with it in one particular discussion, but I just wanted to point it out because I think it's significant. There's ligaments that are also helping the attachment point right in here, and then again, here's the facet where it connects to the head of the rib right there. Here's the neck of the rib and the shaft. Okay, so here we go. This is this better view at these floating ribs right here, 11 and 12. Do you notice how there, there's no connection over here? They're just out there. All right. And then here's your false ribs, and then up above are the true ribs right here, 1 through 7. And then your false ribs are 8 through 12 right in here because there's no connection to the sternum. Okay, and I mentioned this before. The uh, tubercle is this, or tubercle is this elevated area which uh, articulates with, with uh, the thoracic vertebrae. Okay, just a different angle. And again, uh, body. If, if we're looking at this right in here, here's here's a, a groove, and here's an angle of the rib. So there's flat areas, but it's also curved as well. The ribs, creating the cage. And here's a close up of it right there. Now, finally, the sternum. The sternum is a really important bone. So not only is it protecting uh, the heart right, right below it, but it's also the midpoint of the thoracic wall right in here. And it's made up of uh, three separate bones. Let's take a look at that sternum right there, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. So the manubrium uh, has uh, the superior area right here has this sort of uh, broad triangular shape right there. That's what we're looking at right there, manubrium. And it articulates with the collarbone or clavicle. Okay, That's part of your appendicular skeleton. So this is a connection point right over here at this, um, right to the side of the jugular notch. Do you notice here the jugular notch is here? So here's your cl cl clavicular notch right over here. So that's the articulation point right on the side of your manubrium that articulates with the clavicle. And it also connects right here to the very first rib pair. So one on, on, on the right side, as you, as you can see here, and then one on the anatomical left side. So it articulates with the, uh, the rib, the first rib, and also the clavicle, okay? Now the body or flat part right there is the attachment area for the costal cartilage, which ultimately is then connecting to the ribs, okay, the true ribs, if you will, are attached to the sternum. And where do they attach to the sternum? At the body of the sternum right there. Okay. Now the xiphoid process, which is this little tiny bone below, which is vulnerable to fracture, it's the smallest part of the sternum, and it, and it, it articulates with the body the sternum right there, xiphoid process. And the xiphoid process, you can see here with this green arrow, uh, attaches to the di diaphragm, which is right below the lungs, not shown, and uh, attached to this rectus, uh, meaning straight abdominus muscles right here, really large. Okay, And that concludes our discussion of the axial skeleton, and in particular, uh, uh, just to just to refresh you at the very end it, it wasn't a discussion of the skull which is part of the axial skeleton but in particular the vertebral column and the thoracic cage uh, and also including uh, the sternum so i hope you enjoyed it i hope you learned a few things and more than anything else i hope it sparked interest in further uh, study on your career so thanks for watching